Mark Silverman, I'm the general counsel of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Um, and uh, as we've seen fr from today's presentation already, the, the Landmarks Lot 50 has shown itself to be quite resilient and quite flexible. Um, and it's understandable uh, for New Yorkers if, you know, they just think that everything's fine on this side of the Hudson um, and we don't need to change anything. Um, I'm from Chicago, however, and, and Chicagoans don't have the same view of what happens in New York as being the most important and perfect thing. And I think the idea of looking elsewhere to see how preservation is accomplished and attempted in, in other jurisdictions is useful, and especially as we look ahead to the next 50 years. Are there provisions and other laws that may prove to be um, useful uh, to New Yorkers? And what we've done today is, is not, not as a prescriptive, but more as a descriptive idea to, to look at different ideas and have us think about them. And um, as how would they apply in New York? Uh, would it work? Are things so different here that it, it's just not feasible? But these are all interesting ideas, and I think they bear uh, serious consideration. And I'm really fortunate, we're all fortunate to have um, a panel full of people with very interesting and different ideas and experiences. Um, so the, the full bios are in, are in your, your uh, program, but just quickly, um, the, in the order that they'll, they'll speak, I think Peter Byrne is a professor at Georgetown. He's also the mayor's agent uh, for the city, uh, for the District of Columbia. And he's going to talk about this thing called the special merit exception, which is very different than we have in New York, which is a very binary view. When an application comes to the Landmarks Commission, we can find it appropriate or there's a hardship, and there's no in between. And DC has a different approach to that with a very interesting idea called the special merit exception, and he was gonna talk about how that works. Um, Ellen Lipsy is the former executive director of the Boston Landmarks Commission. She's gonna talk about the, what's going on in Boston, in the Boston area, where there's a plethora of different types of historic districts. Like, why is that? How useful is that? Is that a model that we could think of going forward to, to address uh, neighborhood preservation or other types of preservation ideas. In addition, she's going to talk about these. Uh, what's it like to have local commissions on each for each historic district? Is that a model that we should think about? How would it work in New York? Um, Will Cook, Associate uh, General Counsel at the National Trust, is going to talk about a lot of different things happening, happening nationally, but he's going to focus on the survey that's going on in LA, which is the, a, a comprehensive survey of every neighborhood in the city and to try not only identify, but maybe perhaps rank um, resources. And last but certainly not least, Maurice Cox, who's the uh, new director of planning at, uh, in Detroit. He's, and he also has much experience in New Orleans dealing with the post-hurricane recovery there. He's going to talk about how preservation functions in a situation where there's been extreme disruption one natural, one, one economic, um, but talk about how preservation functions in that context. So with that, Peter, do you want to start us off? I'm, ju <clears throat> I'm just thrilled to have a chance to speak here today. I am myself a native New Yorker having grown up in the Bronx. Uh, and so I do appreciate the fact that New Yorkers uh, will accept, will listen with a um, healthy skepticism to uh, what's being done in a little toy city down uh, I-95 called Washington, D.C. Uh, but we have a preservation ordinance that has a lot of important similarities to New York. Uh, one, it allows designation of property solely uh, on evaluation of their historical significance without legislative uh, it, well, necessary legislative involvement. Uh, we strictly prohibit demolition except for these categories of exception I'll talk about. And we cover a large number, a percentage of the buildings uh, in the District of Columbia. 20% of the buildings in the District of Columbia are under historic preservation jurisdiction. So it plays a very uh, central and ongoing role uh, in the urban development process there. Uh, so, well, what is this special merit thing? Um, so uh, DC's Historic Landmark and Historic District Protection Act uh, allows the mayor's agent uh, to issue a permit for demolition or alteration of a landmark or a contributing building to an historic district um, uh, when doing so is necessary for the construction of, uh, of a project of special merit. Let's see, there we go. Um, um, the act defines uh, special merit in a somewhat tongue-tying fashion. 
uh, but it points to projects with exemplary architecture, uh, outstanding land use uh, planning, or projects that provide very important community services. And the mayor's agent makes these determinations only after review by our Historic uh, Preservation, uh, Preservation Review Board, which is like the LPC, uh, and then a full public evidentiary hearing uh, issuing a decision that's subject to judicial review. Uh, and the mayor's agent opinions are published uh, on the website of the law library at Georgetown uh, University, um, and parties cite them as precedents uh, in, uh, in, in the cases. And over time, our Court of Appeals has developed a number of interpretive rules for special merit. For example, it makes clear that public benefits common to all new developments, such as increased property taxes or construction jobs, cannot constitute special merit, uh, but only something distinctive to that development uh, and to the site, uh, to the site as a whole. Uh, this, uh, this, re this slide refers to a case in which the Court of Appeals uh, reversed a decision uh, by the mayor's agent uh, for being too lenient in finding special merit simply for things that were not uh, supported by the comprehensive plan. And this is an important aspect, is that in finding that uh, community benefits are important, have a high level of importance to the citizens of the city, uh, the mayor's agent uh, should uh, look at the, uh, what's in the comprehensive plan and make specific reference to it uh, uh, in order to justify it. So <clears throat> by now, uh, DC has a well-developed body of law, uh, and I believe it strikes a wholesome balance uh, mm -hmm. according to predictable and legally confined standards. Um, uh, so in the past 10 years, there have been 13 applications uh, for, uh, for special merit. Um, 10 have been granted, two rejected, and one is currently pending. And, and, but most of those that were accepted uh, went through a long process of refinement with the Historic Preservation Review Board in order to be able to show that the historic preservation losses from the granting of special merit would, uh, would not be uh, too severe. And it's important to note that you have to find, the mayor's agent has to find that the demolition or alteration proposed is necessary to construct the project of special merit um, um, uh, uh, going forward. So, so what's the virtue of the special merit process? Well, it allows a thoughtful and transparent weighing of preservation values with specific facts against specific competing public values. And symbolically, it affirms that historic preservation, while important and protected, is not an absolute. Um, Process-wise, uh, process -wise, it allows uh, designation decisions, some made decades ago, to be coordinated with evolving planning priorities. And this importantly takes uh, pressure off the designation process uh, itself, uh, because extending historic preservation protection to a building does not preclude uh, new developments that are important to the public on that site uh, in the future. And we all have uh, been aware of, uh, of how um, anticipation of uh, politically popular other forms of important developments have prevented designation uh, of buildings uh, with obvious historic uh, significance. So that inflexibility at the back end of the process can defeat the extension of preservation protection to a property, which then can uh, be, uh, uh, much of which can be preserved in the, um, uh, in the special merit process. And we all know that New York City has experienced repeated litigation uh, over the LPC chair's occasional refusal to schedule designation hearings uh, uh, for buildings that were later, uh, later demolished. Uh, and other, although other cities have much worse processes than, than, than that. Um, okay, well, uh, how about a few, a few cases to explain? This is a very simple one involving firehouses. Uh, federal regulations have changed the size of, uh, of, uh, of fire trucks, and DC has many historic uh, firehouses. Um, and so what to do? Well, we have allowed the widening of doors in order to keep the uh, firehouses in use, serving as firehouses, even though it involved uh, significant change to the character-defining front of the building. That is special merit case based on alteration, and we actually have a provision in our law that specifically says that, um, uh, uh, that 
uh, uh, substantial rehabilitation or new construction for operational needs of a public safety facility uh, has a significantly higher priority than, than historic preservation. Well, that's, that's just a simple illustration. We have some much more complicated cases. This case um, uh, is one that I adjudicated. Uh, you had two contributing but uh, very deteriorated buildings on Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Avenue uh, on the edge of the Anacostia Historic District, a district, a, a district in a <clears throat> relatively low-income part of town that was established in the mid-70s, but is really only now finding momentum for restoration. The DC Department of uh, Housing and Community Development became the owners and sought a developer who would respect preservation. Well, they chose a particular developer, but after looking at a number of possibilities, uh, they identified sites within the district to move the houses. So they proposed to move the houses to clear the lot in order to construct 140 units of affordable housing financed with DC, DC subsidies uh, and federal low-income tax uh, credits. Um, now, uh, because we all know that moving a house can destroy its integrity of location, it's an alteration that the R.S. Dark Preservation Review Board uh, uh, could not consider to be consistent with the purposes of the act. So the district and the developer had to argue for special merit, and there was substantial opposition from uh, preservation groups and community groups. But after two full days of hearing, the mayor's agent found that the provision of affordable housing and really uh, uh, path-breaking retail space within this community uh, would constitute uh, special merit for, for the project. And the mayor's agent also found <clears throat> that, the, the, that the care with which the city was uh, looking to relocate the houses uh, and the amount of resources they would put into, uh, into restoring them minimized the preservation loss and helped, uh, helped to justify, uh, helped to justify uh, the action. So that's one uh, leading example which I, is in your materials. So, uh, so the advantages then, so, so this system works because there, it, it strikes a balance between preservation and other public values. It does so in a public and transparent way that's more legal than political uh, using precedent and judicial review. Uh, so um, I offer it for your consideration, and I look forward to talking uh, with you about it uh, as the conference goes on. Thank you. Do you, do you want this down? Yeah. Happy 50th anniversary to the LPC. Um, I retired last year, so I can speak personally as well as professionally. The Boston Landmarks Commission was established 40 years ago. Two districts administered by the BLC predate its enabling legislation. You heard about one, Beacon Hill, 1955, Back Bay's 1966. They are the precursors of two landmark districts, South End and Four Point Channel, all four have local, state, regional, and national significance and are intended to have the highest level of protection. The BLC also designates architectural conservation districts, are, and there are five ACDs. These have neighborhood and local significance and were intended to accommodate less restrictive guidelines. In fact, Thank you. The individual uh, guidelines for all nine districts are equivalent in the level of protection afforded. As you well know, district regulation often is triggered by threats to the historic look and feel of a neighborhood, such as replacement of a single family house with a larger multi-unit residential building or a pop-up roof addition but finer grain changes can um, also trigger a, the loss of original trim or installation of inappropriate replacement windows, even the loss of trees or incursions for front yard parking. And this, these are petitions that come from communities. Residents interested in a historic district want protection from incremental erosion. 
The refrain to the BLC is that wouldn't be allowed in Beacon Hill and it shouldn't be okay in their neighborhood either. Each landmark district or ACD has specific guidelines in order to recognize signature features that help define the neighborhood. For instance, brownstone facades and ironwork railings in the South Atlanta Mark District and rock outcroppings in the Aberdeen ACD. Roughly 8% of Boston buildings are within nine local historic districts. Each district commission meets monthly as needed. Approximately 1,200 applications are reviewed annually. Review covers alterations to existing buildings, additions, demolition, binding review over all, um, as well as new construction and site and landscape features. In seven districts, review applies to what is visible from a public way. Back Bay reviews all exterior changes. South End has limited alley review, but covers everything else visible from a public way. Although the Boston Landmarks Commission was established in the city's planning agency, the BRA, which is also the development agency, the BLC moved to the Environment Department, created in 1982 to aim to champion and protect the built natural environment. However, there is a zoning tool called a Neighborhood Design Overlay District, an NDOD, administered under the BRA, created in the late 80s or early 1990s with the criteria that the district either be listed in the National Register or considered eligible for listing by the Landmarks Commission. An NDOD is intended to protect existing scale, the quality of the pedestrian environment, character of the residential neighborhoods, and concentrations of historic buildings. It is essentially an urban design tool in areas where development is encouraged, aimed at new construction or rehabilitation that preserves and complements the character of existing housing. There are 54 NDODs containing around 12% of buildings in Boston. Review is staff level at the BRA and covers additions to massing over 300 square feet changes to roof shape and cornice line, street wall height, and other alterations that change a building's massing or size or door or window openings as specified in the underlying neighborhood zoning. A butters, neighborhood organizations, and elected <coughs> officials are notified by mail and have 10 days to review plans in the BRA office. The BLC, may be included with a 30-day plans review. The Landmarks Commission can invoke a 90-day demolition delay at a Landmarks Commission hearing for a building within an NDOD and suggest ways to avoid or mitigate demolition. Uh, you have material, I believe, on the Dorchester NDOD description and small projects design review standards for zoning. Boston tools, pros and cons, and reflections. Separate district commissions. It's very effective to have commissioners from the neighborhood supplemented by landmarks commissioners with relevant professional expertise. On the other hand, there are about 50 commissioners for landmarks and nine districts. It's difficult to find volunteers to serve. The Landmarks Commission commissioners are taxed, over taxed, to serve on district commissions. Confirmation by the mayor and city council for appointments may languish. City Hall has limited meeting space. Um, it's hard to find a place for all these commissions to meet monthly. District commissioners may be put in positions where they feel uncomfortable ruling 
on their neighbors and they get lobbied. And there are budgetary constraints for staff resources that currently make it very difficult to consider creating more districts. Individual uh, design review guidelines are developed during the study process for designation to uh, recognize distinguishing physical features, but slight variations in common guidelines may be confusing from district to district. Landmark districts are crucial to afford maximum protection. Um, they have to certainly continue. Architectural conservation districts celebrate neighborhood flavor, and there's an opportunity for additional ACDs and for ACDs, both existing and future, to develop pared down guidelines that are less restrictive than those for landmarks. And that might create more support for LCDs. Neighborhood design overlay districts, as I mentioned, serve an urban design function, really more than historic preservation. There's very little review for alterations to historic fabric, and there is no public process like a hearing. So what should one make of, of the Boston approach? I'm throwing in a model from across the river. Cambridge has neighborhood design, um, neighborhood conservation districts, as well as landmark districts. The NCDs combine positive aspects of the BLCs, ACDs, and the BRA NDODs, and you also, I think, have guidelines from Avon, Avon Hill. They have a two-tiered approach for review of alterations to existing fabric in NR districts within conservation districts, but not review of alterations to existing fabric outside of the NRs. <clears throat> Lots to think about, and I'm happy to talk to people later. Thank you. Um, talk about looking elsewhere. I'm from Beaufort, South Carolina originally. Spent a lot of time in Charleston in my lifetime, but um, I did spend a number of years living in New York, and it was a treasured time and a treasured time in my life. So it's always. Um, Wonderful to be back here, and I continue to draw a lot of inspiration from the preservation work that is, um, has gone on here in the past. It's a real treat to, to be here with fellow, fellow speakers. I'm going to do kind of a little peripatetic fly-through of what's happening that we're seeing at the National Trust on a national level from you know, local preservation districts across the um, country right now. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I mainly wanted to um, talk to you a little bit about some innovative things happening in the city of Los Angeles, which I'll, I'll conclude with. But um, it occurred to me as I was preparing for today and for the Fitch Colloquium last week that, um, and I'm sure many of you have experienced this, but you know, preservation laws are under attack in <laughs> a lot of places. And there have been some recent attacks that we've been monitoring or participating in as friends of the court, the National Trust. I mean, Hannah, which we've heard about from Gerald Caden, this all-out attack on the plain language of the ordinance, you know, really attacking very commonly used words like historic and significance and what architecture means or compatible or context. And fortunately, this has been a case where this has been a, bit, a little bit like a ping-pong match. It's gone up and back to the appellate courts twice, the state Supreme Court a couple times, which denied review. And um, I wish I could say it was over. But um, this case is now on remand to the trial court that has continued to uphold the law, but it, it is now there on an equal protection challenge. Um, we feel pretty confident the same trial judge will find that those um, equal protection challenges lack um, merit. Uh, a, recent a very recent case out of Charleston, which I just wanted to um, mention to you, and you know, Charleston's always kind of a fun city to talk about. Um, I think it gets a an undeserved reputation for having a strong preservation law. It's obviously the earliest preservation law in the country, but it's, you know, it's vague, and I have to say from a lot of years and being involved in litigation there, there's a lot of arbitrary enforcement. 
Um, this is a case, however, of the, the Preservation Commission, I would say, doing the right thing. This is an old um, 1960s kind of asbestos-filled building. It was built before the enactment of the height limits in the city of Charleston. And um, kind of in, in line with the city's comprehensive um, preservation plan, the Board of Architectural Review took this desired approach we see in the middle, which is very similar to the current kind of skyline. Um, you see the undesired skyline, which is more of a, you know, a, a big urban city approach, and, and um, turned down this, what for Charleston is a very large building. And if you've ever been to Charleston, you know it's a city characterized by two-story and three-story buildings of a very human, you know, small scale. Um, this design was turned down by the Preservation Commission as being incompatible with the existing neighborhood, even though existing zoning allowed um, the, the, the construction of a building that would, would stretch approximately 12 to 14 um, stories tall. That has prompted that has prompted a lawsuit by the developer that's an all-out attack on the, the constitutionality um, of the Charleston Ordinance. So we'll be weighing in on that as a friend of the court. We don't anticipate it um, prevailing. Now, Trust is also involved as an amicus recently with Palisades across the river. This involved a um, proposed development by the LG Electronics Corporation and went to the Intermediate Appellate Court in New Jersey. A settlement was reached with conservation plaintiffs to lower the proposed height. The, the lawsuits that um, were involved in this case had to do with illegal variances being granted and illegal spot zoning. I like to mention Palisades because I think it helps show that there's sometimes an over-reliance on um, zoning laws to um, protect historic resources. And what we, we know from the Palisades is that was, that was not the case. Uh, settlement was reached, as I mentioned, with the conservation plans to lower the height. Um, there was a decision that was reached a week or so ago by the Intermediate Appellate Court that um, did, in fact, strike down the, um, the, the grant of the variance that would have allowed this 153-foot tower to be built. So what happens next, we don't know. I mean, the court you know, had language in its opinion that LG could revisit the zoning process with the lowered height at the tree line. Um, Gerald Caden obviously mentioned Midtown Ventures, and I won't... I won't uh, mention that again, and obviously not a frontal attack on the local preservation law itself, but certainly there's this takings component to it that makes us nervous in the, in the preservation world. One of the things that's, um, I mean, it's a joy, but also a frustration at the Trust to, to be asked to talk about what's happening on a national level. There's so many local preservation ordinances. I mean, the most recent count done by the National Park Service was 2,000, uh, 2,600 local preservation laws. Um, but that number has not been updated since, um, since 2008. There is, um, there's always a, a lot of discussion, though, about what different communities are doing differently, and I wanted to share with you a few of the tools that we're seeing a lot of communities examine and, in some cases, um, start to implement. Um, we've been really big at the National Trust on encouraging the, an expansive approach to traditional cultural properties in urban areas include things like German villages or you know, Chinatowns, Little Italy's. They're not just for large rural landscapes that we commonly associate with Native American communities, but the National Park Service is really hoping to see an expansion of the use of traditional cultural properties, and this can be a really important hook for Section 106 protections under the National Historic Preservation Act. Baltimore is doing some really, really innovative things right now with special use districts. Um, the Maryland has passed a pretty powerful um, tax incentive law for art-related districts, um, provides incentives for property owners who are rehabilitating the arts districts that can twin on these um, state tax abatements and deductions on top of historic rehabilitation tax credit programs. And it also applies to new urban infill that's designed for artist-related housing or um, artist-related workspace. And there are even some income tax um, reductions for artists who continue to work and live in these areas. So we're starting to see that's having a big revitalization effect in some neighborhoods. You all know about na neighborhood conservation districts. There's a lot of increased thought about how to use these. Um, one little caveat is, depending on how they're calibrated, they can often end up just as strict as a, a preservation district. So um, I think you see a broad range of how these neighborhood conservation districts can be regulated. Form-based codes, um, for those of you in the planning world, hear about this from time to time. Um, Charleston just commissioned this report by Andres Duani to revisit the, um, 
how the Board of Architectural Review, its Preservation Commission, conducts business. And even though the name form-based code is not used in this proposal, there's a lot of form-based elements in here. We don't know exactly if this will mesh from a I guess, legal enforcement point of view. I mean, form-based codes obviously are premised in the idea of development as of right, um, which is you know, completely inconsistent with discretionary review that we're all accustomed to under <laughs> preservation districts. And adaptive reuse ordinances, um, LA, I mentioned I'm kind of focusing on LA, um, they have done a lot with adaptive reuse ordinances. I believe the first adaptive reuse, um, some of the first adaptive reuse projects took place in um, New York, but LA has really been um, drilling down into these ordinances as a way of increasing affordable housing um, in the city. And the National Trust Preservation Green Lab commissioned a report in the past year called Learning um, from Los Angeles. LA is a really interesting city, I think, from a, a preservation point of view because there's so much diversity um, of architecture. And for those of us who were at the Fitch Colloquium last week, we all learned a lot from Ken Bernstein, who's the director of the office of, um, or the manager of the Office of Historic, um, Historic Resources. And, and one of the reasons I wanted to, to um, bring up LA today is that I think it's a, LA has done a terrific job of promoting um, not just historic resources in its city, but also um, using its law to be very um, comprehensive and inclusive um, in terms of cultural heritage. So as a result, it's developed one of the most progressive inventories of historic and cultural properties um, in the country. Many people don't realize the landmarks law in um, LA, or rather the city of Los Angeles is cultural heritage ordinance was adopted um, a few years prior to New York's own ordinance. It was the first large city ordinance um, they're very proud of to say. And it applies to individual buildings and sites. They call their landmarks historic cultural monuments. Again, it's focus on culture. There are over a thousand resources listed. That's often a surprise to folks. Um, and it's a rather, relatively small um, commission of five members that oversees um, the designation process. Um, Again, just the fact that it's called a cultural heritage mission, I think, helps show that the, there's a very cultural heritage-centric approach. I'm not going to read a lot of this to you, but one of the things that I think would be a good you know, takeaway from the composition section of Los Angeles' ordinances is that it's very broad-minded in terms of including not just people with demonstrated historic preservation interests, but folks with back, backgrounds in folklore, cultural anthropology, curation, conservation, landscape architecture, and related disciplines. So again, just um, very broad-minded. Um, historic preservation overlay zones, um, not necessarily an uncommon feature. There are 30 separately administered ones. In, um, in the city of LA that um, in addition to buildings also have a focus on structures, landscaping, and natural features. And one of my favorite sort of um, portions of the historic overlay zone ordinance has to do with how culture is defined. Um, anything pertaining to the concepts, skills, habits, arts, instruments, or instantations of a given people at a given point in time. Incredibly broad conception of, of culture. And, this, there's a jewel in the historic definition, um, includes you know, the traditional buildings and structures, but also natural phenomena. So um, as a result, LA has included um, trees, these very large fig trees, Venice Canal, an LGBT site called the Black Cat that has um, you know, had a number of, of changes over the years, and also some um, incentive programs that you see in other cities. But the, the thing I'll leave you with, and I hope you'll do some additional research on it, research about it on your own, is this very innovative project called Survey LA that LA has undertaken with the Getty, um, and which has provided about $2.5 million grant to undertake this comprehensive um, resource survey of the city using crowdsourcing and iPads and a fascinating um, technological platform called Arch Arches that allows consultants and um, community members to go out and take photographs and give um, you know, their drop-down boxes that help describe the architecture of, of, the, um, of the architectural elements that they're uncovering. And what's been so fascinating um, to it to me is when they started this project in 2000, they've wrapped it up in 2006, but in 2000, less than 15% 
of LA had been surveyed, and they anticipate being finished with this um, in the next few years because of this large boost, um, large boost from Getty. But the takeaway for me from Fitch Colloquium last week, which I thought we, we all thought was very inspiring, is that you know LA is really looking at at this survey as a way of broadening, um, ultimately broadening their inventory. And so as properties are downloaded into this database, there are determinations of eligibility made for National Register listed um, potential, state listed potential, as well as local potential. And what this has done is it is, um, it is uh, I guess, revealed categories of architecture that had not been thought of as um, existing beyond individual neighborhoods. So what LA is finding is they've actually got these great collections of things like as diverse as stilt houses, Cinderella ranch houses, log cabins, and even air raid sirens, um, which are over the city. They're 225 built in World War II through the Cold War, and they're about 75% remaining. But I think a lot of what they're uncovering through the survey has been surprising, and it'll be interesting to see how the survey plays out. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's, it's uh, wonderful to be back home. I was uh, born and raised here in New York and went to high school on 57th Street and 2nd Avenue um, in a high school that's no longer there. It's been demolished uh, to make way for a high rise with a new high school at its base. Um, I wanted to start first with a disclosure. Uh, I am not a preservationist. And uh, this was um, a quote that I often heard uh, in the communities that I lived in um, amongst uh, other African Americans who did not frame their advocacy for the built environment in terms of preservation. Um, in fact, I was an architect um, who lived in a district that um, is characterized by those images below uh, that I assumed was protected, only to discover um, that it was locally unprotected and any of those structures could be demolished without question. So I began to try to organize uh, my neighbors uh, to stop this. And what was interesting is they were not particularly moved um, by the campaign to save the structures, what they were moved by was the campaign to preserve the stories of the people who were associated with those buildings. And the fact that African Americans had a very robust chapter in the history of those buildings. And it was only at that point when we began to talk about the simple stories of everyday buildings and the involvement of African Americans in them did we hit a turning point and got one of the first low-income neighborhoods in Charlottesville um, designated as such, and those buildings became locally protected. So it raised a very um, important question to me. So who is going to preserve um, our neighborhoods? Who um, are the stewards of those neighborhoods? Who keeps them until um, the preservationists arrive? Um, often, the, those who preserve those buildings are people who are already there, um, people who um, have strong uh, social networks um, and perceive these as places of cultural value, um, whether it's in the rural of Virginia of Bayview, where people talked about uh, the stoic character of farmhouses, uh, in fields or in a rebuilding effort um, that I engaged in with this community over an eight-year period. Uh, even as a new community emerged, uh, a sense of the rural character was a part of their preservation agenda. And so I think of these people who stayed in place and preserved the culture of those place, places as the true preservationists, um, even if they uh, don't understand themselves to be as such. In um, New Orleans, literally, people fought their way to come back to rebuild their community, um, as is characterized by uh, Roberta's book, We're Still Here, You Bastards. The reality is there is um, an assault 
on the very resources that um, preserve the culture in communities like um, New Orleans, where uh, Mayor Landrieu uh, embarked on a campaign to demolish 10,000 structures in his first term. And these are often very simple, everyday structures um, of a community, the kind of buildings that individuals restore and re-inhabit. So um, one, one man's blight is another man's um, neighborhood memory, um, or in this case, Design Center, uh, which was the first house of the Tulane City Center that I directed. Um, at the inauguration, the woman in pink uh, remembered this as Katie's Beauty Salon, where she got her um, beautician's license. Uh, so this um, artifact embed, uh, embedded in this neighborhood um, held a cultural memory for her. But also um, things as simple or mundane as food shopping, uh, where the Circle Foods grocery store was um, destroyed during um, Katrina, uh, and after eight years post-Katrina had still not come back. And many New Orleanians felt that this grocery store, one of the first owned and continually operated by African Americans, was going to be the signal as to whether um, New Orleans had come back. Working together with uh, the owner of it and coming up with a business plan that could reimagine Circle Foods, um, in 2010, Circle Foods opened to much community acclaim. Um, and what I understood uh, was this was not simply a grocery store. This was a one-stop shop of culture for that community, everything from your band uniforms um, to your back-to-school equipment would be found at Circle Foods. But also, sometimes there are um, cultural um, forms that have to do with music, um, like the Dewdrop Inn, a famed um, jazz joint on La Salle, um, that we assisted um, the owner, Kenneth Jackson, in bringing back. And you can see the dilapidated structure in the corner there is what it looked like today and then during its heyday. Um, and what it means to foreground the culture that went on in that building as he began to raise money to uh, reopen this place as a club and as a music center. Um, but one of the more extraordinary cultural um, preservation efforts that I've been involved in in New Orleans has to do with the Mardi Gras Indians and the creation of a cultural campus um, for their um, rituals. These, this is the Mardi Gras Indian Council um, with over 400 years of continuous masking amongst these men, wanting to understand how do they take uh, an ephemeral culture, uh, a street-based culture, and develop an economic development strategy that preserves the local culture. This is what the Mardi Gras Indians look like when they are fully suited uh, and they parade in the streets. So the context, the neighborhood context, is absolutely critical to their ability uh, to do their rituals. Um, how do you take something that is street-based, ephemeral, uh, and turn it into a resource for, culture, for community economic development? That was a challenge. How do you have a place to house their artifacts and to allow for um, uh, th them to monetize uh, that culture. In the case of the Mardi Gras Indians, it became a cultural corridor. Um, the idea of purchasing a, a block of the city, a series of shotgun houses, and turning it into a cultural campus. Um, so buildings uh, like this double shotgun was one of seven uh, that would be repurposed to create a cultural campus. So none of these men considered themselves preservationists, and yet they found themselves uh, being shepherds or stewards of the built fabric as testament to the kind of uh, neighborhood that they uh, grew up and loved. So I'll quickly talk about um, the challenge of preserving Detroit. 
which is partly why I accepted uh, Gerald's invitation to come speak here. Um, the question of who preserves uh, Detroit uh, is um, an interesting one to me um, because many of the people who are uh, most invested in its preservation are the people uh, who never left. Uh, 700,000 of them, those who see preservation not as a preservation of buildings, but as a preservation of culture, like Youssef Shakur. Or those who remember the complete erasure of African American neighborhoods during the 1960s um, to make way for the new city. Um, this is not how um, demolition is done uh, today. Demolition today is done house by house in a patchwork of foreclosed structures in the tens of thousands that have left a pattern of, of, of vacancy um, that is staggering. Uh, over 80,000 structures, uh, residential structures, um, are vacant within the city. Um, and even at the rate of 250 demolitions a week, which is the current pace, um, the city has only gotten to about 7,000 structures demolished. And in its place, you have this enormous uh, vacancy, right? So the pattern of, um, of demolition and the pattern of blight is very, very different than what we've seen traditionally. And how do you use that? Well, um, one of the things we're doing is beginning to think about how these structures can be saved. Um, a program that um, categorizes, prioritizes, and seeks strategic investments for structures um, that can house vital enterprises in Detroit. Um, I'm talking about churches. Uh, dozens of them. This one sold for $6,700. Um, or schools, of which there are 75 that are vacant today, um, and possibly another 25 to 50 that will be closed in the next 18 months. Or um, the um, archdiocese of the city that announced to me last week that they're closing 14 campuses uh, within the city in 2016. Or um, in the recent um, press, um, the American Motors Corporation headquarters that was sold for $500. Um, and uh, bought by a speculator who wants to scrap, uh, scrap the, the materials. But the reality of the built artifact is key to telling the story, the cultural story of these places. Whether it's Hitsville that started in two modest houses in a, re a residential neighborhood, or the Douglas Public Housing Project where Diana Ross and the Supremes grew up, um, that are, is now, has now been demolished along with the Motown headquarters, which is this nine-story building, which was the transition from the single-family house to um, a headquarters to um, Los Angeles. Um, when we lose the buildings, we lose the capacity to tell the story. Um, this is one silver lining. This is the rec center uh, that Joe Lewis learned to box in, and we were able to preserve it and not only put it into a context where one understood it as the primary historic set piece. So housing development will happen in front of it, a, uh, a, a park will be placed, uh, and it will be the backdrop for that new neighborhood. Um, but also buildings, individual buildings, no matter how small, uh, can begin to be the anchor of the new um, Detroit that is to be built. Uh, such as this mansion, which you can see right there on the corner, that um, will be enveloped into a set of city blocks that will be under construction uh, next week. So without that simple building to anchor the corner, um, the story of that neighborhood and the fabric could not be told. 
Sometimes the scales are gigantuan, such as the Herman Kiefer Hospital, uh, 800,000 square feet, three schools on a 10-acre site. How do you tell the story beyond the monument? So we grabbed 20 blocks around the hospital to begin to keep the neighborhood fabric in the context of the monument, uh, a, a different approach. So not just the monument, but be going beyond the monument. And the reason to go beyond the monument is, is because we caught uh, the critical site uh, where the riots broke out in 1967 by capturing uh, a neighborhood framework, a district framework, uh, for that monument. So in my mind, um, these are the folks who will preserve Detroit. They're the folks who stayed. They're the folks who want to come back and be a part of the revitalization of the city. They're the folks who are returning, uh, like Wendy uh, Hillard, who has a gymnastics program in Harlem, but came back because she wants to uh, create that program in her hometown. Or uh, these young men who've come back home from New York um, and are now renovating buildings by the block uh, and doing adaptive reuse and historic preservation of these properties. And then my own neighborhood, which has turned 50 years old, so it's now a historic district. I live in Lafayette Park, designed by Mies van der Rohe, and it's an extraordinary collection of modernist uh, buildings embedded in a park. But to get to that, uh, an entire neighborhood was erased. Um, and I feel very strongly that it's possible in the next generation of new neighborhoods of Detroit that we do not have to erase um, those who were there, but we can actually preserve the memories, like those who stayed. Uh, these are folks who um, were part of the second wave of those who lived in Lafayette Park. And as we imagine new neighborhoods, as we are now, um, can we do it with no displacement and no destruction uh, now that we have this enormous amount of vacant land available? So that's where we are. Um, I'm not a preservationist, but I certainly could use a few good ideas from those who are. Thank you. If you, if people want to um, ask some questions, we have a, some opportunity, but I'll take the moderator's prerogative to ask to start off. But if people are interested, um, we're going to have some mics available. Um, but Marie, if I could just ask you a question uh, as the last speaker. Um, to what extent uh, there was a Secretary of Interior Salazar had a big press conference about this, the historic tax credits and Detroit being an incubator for their use. And do you think that preservation in a place like Detroit with so many extreme issues in front of it that the tax credit sort of envisions uh, preservation at too high a level, that it needs to be more flexible when it's dealing with the, the scale of um, the preservation needs in a community like Detroit? Um, you have yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, historic tax credits uh, are traditionally um, a mechanism to help close the gap. Um, it certainly has never uh, seen a challenge quite like Detroit. Um, and so as a mechanism, I think we need a lot more uh, nimble and um, versatile um, systems. Some of the, ch some of the challenges um, are challenges of scale. Uh, and uh, resource allocation that's needed to um, renovate something that's a whole school. So even if you, um, uh, even if you have a group of nonprofit entrepreneurs that might be able to fill like one or two classrooms of a, of a school, well, you still have 80, you know, you still have 20 others and a cafeteria and a gymnasium. And so the challenge I have found is finding those who know how um, to do adaptive reuse, know how to get it financed, and know how to work with communities um, um, to revitalize these structures. So finding those matches, and we hope that this program 
uh, save that we'll try to bring them together, um, we'll make some progress on it. Um, Peter, um, with respect to the um, special merit exception, what role, I think it's an interesting idea, the special K, um, K case you were talking about was a, one of the issues was there was going to be 114 units of, of affordable housing uh, created. And I'm just wondering, where, where are there limits to what constitutes a special merit uh, project? Um, suppose um, there were 200 units or 300 units. Is there a, is there a moment or is there a, a mechanism that either you as the mayor's agent or the Historic Preservation Review Board can say too much of a good thing is happening in this neighborhood. It's too big, ultimately. Uh, so, right, so the, the question, and this actually came up in the Big K case, is that some of the community groups felt that uh, putting 140 units of affordable housing in that spot would, uh, would, would, would uh, damage the capacity of the historic district to evolve uh, in the ways that people hoped it would evolve. Um, and I, I think, uh, you know, there are planning principles that come into that uh, and that one could imagine the planners weighing in to say that this shouldn't be considered a project of special merit because uh, it's not well conceived to fit into the neighborhood. Those kind of issues uh, are, are, are open and on the table uh, in a special merit case. So they're very fact specific in that way. Uh, and um, uh, uh, and uh, people uh, qualify uh, expert witnesses uh, to testify on those kinds of, those kinds of questions. Um, and, and so to, as a follow up to that, what role does the preservation board uh, in DC have to modify a project. So, so that when you right. approved a project of 114 units, it came back to the, to, the, uh, to the board. Could they have said, we'll give you 90? Right, so they would have done it, I think, not on the, on the basis of the number of affordable units, but on the scale of the building. In other words, that, we, that the building would be too large for the site, uh, or that the design features uh, were were uh, not appropriate for the historic district that it's in. So it is it is the case that when these cases come forward to the mayor's agent to determine whether the demolition is justified, uh, there will at the same time have been a process for the new development that goes through the Historic Preservation Review Board. And I'll tell you, the mayor's agent pays a lot of attention to how the Historic Preservation Review Board views the compatibility of the new project with the rest of the historic context. Interesting. Is there does anyone else have any questions? I hate to. Um, uh, okay. And uh, finally, I just I think we're running out of time. Um, uh, Will, if you could talk a little bit about the survey in LA, and, and I think what's interesting is this notion that every community is ranking buildings, and to what extent does this does this survey? Uh, presuppose any comparison between one region and another? Is every region being entitled to the same amount of preservation? Um, is there a comparative thing happening that, oh, this is an arts and crafts building here, it's not as good as one over there, therefore only the latter will be designated? Is that happening at this time, or is it, is it too early? Yeah, I think it's too early to conclude what will happen with all the data that's being collected. I think the idea is to get as many people on the ground as possible collecting this data. As I, as I mentioned, it's a crowdsourcing um, data collection project. And so, I, and the goal is to cover all of the different areas of the city of LA. I think there are a couple of gaps where they haven't begun to undertake the survey process. So I think the, the jury's still out on on what the data will show. But what they've been excited about is that, that they're discovering these new categories of buildings that they had, had not thought of before in terms of um, you know, multiple properties. And I think the kind of excitement is that there could be a good case to be made for maybe even multiple property designations under the National Register, state laws, and possibly even local laws. Interesting. Um, and, and finally, Ellen, um, people talk a lot about the difference between landmark designation or historic district designations and conservation districts or architectural districts and you said something that's surprising which is that because these are coming from the community in fact they're being regulated in the same way that people even though they're different tools um, that the outcome in some ways is not a vastly different level of regulation could you why do you think that is just control 
I think it's loss, threats, uh, and control, and fear of change, um, and fear of loss of the collective story that Maurice mentioned. And I want to make it clear that in Boston, the architectural conservation districts are designated by the landmarks legislation. And in Cambridge, so are the neighborhood uh, conservation districts. So two tiers in, in with Cambridge Historical Commission and Boston Landmarks Commission. Well, that's, that's, uh, I'd like to thank the panelists. We're out of time. Um, and thank you very much for participating in today's conference.